Hello, and welcome back. Today, I'm going to be talking about Dune Messiah by Frank Herbert, the sequel to the 1965 first installment in the Dune series. Please do note that for today's video, I'm going to be doing a bit more of an analysis and giving my thoughts more so than a review, so do expect light spoilers for the first two books of the Dune series. Let's give some context before diving into my thoughts. In Dune, the first installment of the series, we meet Paul Atreides, a young nobleman. Paul's father rules Caladan, a water world where Paul has been raised. At the set of the story, we learn that Paul's father is set to begin ruling a desert planet called Arrakis, also known as Dune. The planet was previously ruled by the sworn enemy of House Atreides. Due to this fact, Paul's father grows increasingly paranoid as the threat of an attack seems imminent. Eventually, the promises of attack ring true and Paul and his mother are cast out into the desert and presumed dead by their enemies. Once abandoned to the desert, Paul begins to develop a kind of prescience, or foresight, allowing him to see possibilities into the future. Soon after venturing into the desert, Paul encounters a group of Fremen, the local people of Arrakis, who live outside of the city borders and survive in the desert. Through a series of trials, Paul and his mother are able to make a place among the people and Paul quickly moves into a leadership position in the community. Paul's abilities, including his prescience and natural skill, are seen as metahuman by the Fremen people, leading his rise from leadership into the religious mythos. The singular vision continually shown to Paul through his prescience is referred to as a crusade or jihad, a religious war in his name which he sees dominating the universe. Paul attempts to sidestep his destiny, but it draws ever nearer, finally beginning on Arrakis as he leads the Fremen to retake the planet. The people follow him into battle, believing their desert world can become a green paradise of flowing water and vegetation under Paul's rule. Originally released in 1969, the story of Dune Messiah picks up a few years after Dune left off, opening with a meeting between a group of conspirators plotting the downfall of Paul, known as Ma Dib. He has become Emperor of the Universe. Arrakis sits at the center of the Empire and has become a sort of religious mecca under Paul's rule. Dune is both an inhospitable planet and the source of the most important natural resource in the universe, the spice known as melange. The spice has many benefits and is highly addictive. Addiction to the spice has the effect of turning one's eyes completely blue. So why is the spice so critical? As is always the case in politics, the person who controls the resources controls the, the economy, therefore holding on to power. The partners involved in the conspiracy against Paul have already lost their power and are in danger of losing even more. Saitel is a new character introduced in Dune Messiah. He is referred to as male, but is a mysterious alien shapeshifter known as a face dancer. Able to exactly replicate the appearance and vocal intonations of potentially anyone regardless of gender. I love the idea of shapeshifters and I think Saito is a super interesting and intelligent villainous presence in the story. While he's not outright evil, he seems playfully chaotic. He seems to revel in the dangerous game being played and doesn't underestimate his opponent in Paul. The Reverend Mother is a known conspirator to the previous Emperor and seemingly not a fan of Paul. A ruling member of the Bene Gesserit, an ancient order which trains young women to be assassins, concubines, and mystics, those trained by the Bene Gesserit exercise mysterious abilities. This order of women have their own mysterious agendas which they try to achieve through eugenics and religious indoctrination working as a shadow government throughout the galaxy. The Princess Irulan is the least sure of her position in the conspiracy, but she is the daughter of the former emperor overthrown by Paul. 
She's married to Paul, but they have a loveless marriage and no children together. She's been trained in the Bene Gesserit way, yet she seems surprisingly pliable to others' plans. The Guild Navigator is drawn into the conspiracy by necessity. Paul is holding a complete monopoly on the spice melange, which is needed for the navigators to travel through space safely. On the other side of the coin, Paul has some close confidants in Chani, Alia, and Stilgar. Chani is Paul's concubine and the mother of his children. Chani is a Fremen and a fierce warrior. Since Paul's reign has begun as emperor, the Fremen and Arrakis have seen unimaginable wealth, and one of the elements this story examines is the effect this newfound wealth and power takes on the people of Arrakis and their culture. Chani is one of the few Fremen who seems to remain unchanged, and her sole devotion seems to be to Paul. Alia is Paul's sister, and a total badass. Easily my favorite character so far in the series, Alia is extremely intelligent, strong, and has mystic abilities rivaled only by her brother. Stilgar is Paul's closest advisor. Originally the leader of the Fremen siege that took Paul and his mother in, Stilgar is a brilliant strategist and fiercely loyal to Paul. One of Stilgar's roles as a character is to act as a fierce traditionalist amidst all of the change that Paul's new empire is seeing. Stilgar remains mostly unchanged with the exception of his perception of Paul, which is something we'll be discussing later in the video. The last major player in this story that I want to include is Hate. He's a Gola, a newly awakened consciousness in the body of one of Paul's deceased advisors and teachers. A fierce warrior in his past life, and were born with additional mental capabilities, Hate is offered as a gift to Paul by the Guild Ambassador. Now that we've established the baseline of the story and the major players, I want to discuss some of the major themes I found throughout the story. While religion is initially used as a tool of control by Paul, Paul and Alia find their newfound status as divine rulers both tedious and taxing. Daily ceremonial rites take place as Arrakis has become a destination for religious pilgrimage. Paul expresses envy at the awe he sees the pilgrims expressing through their worship and devotion. Now he has difficulty trusting in the people around him. Nearly everyone sees him as a messiah, including his own most trusted advisor, Stobar, which creates a power imbalance and further isolates Paul from those around him and the universe he rules. From the first part of the story, we see the conspiracy against Paul is the old government trying to retake power. Paul certainly isn't a perfect leader, as he states that the radical government changes he envisioned quickly devolved into bureaucracy, and his plans for universal peace became meetings and paperwork. When reflecting on his rise to power, Paul marvels at the atrocities committed in his name. We're talking about a galactic genocide in the billions. Paul has promised peace and enlightenment for Arrakis and the greater galaxy, but he questions at what cost his power was gained. Like many great heroes, Paul suffers from hubris, a blinding pride. He predicts his own fate, claims he wants to turn from his dark future, and still makes every move seen in his visions, knowing where this path leads. He is an aware, tragic hero, but this awareness doesn't make much difference in his fate. Ultimately, Paul is so bought into his own prescience that he refuses to believe in his own free will. The main duality we see in Dune Messiah is Paul's vision for the future he wants to build versus the reality of his future. As we discussed earlier, Paul's main goal was to create peace and harmony throughout the galaxy, but instead the worst genocide in the history of the universe is being committed under his name. He promised the Fremen that he would help their planet become an oasis and transform the desert into a world flowing with water. For many reasons, this can never be accomplished. Firstly, due to the universal dependence on spice, the planet cannot be completely terraformed, as this would eliminate the natural resource. Secondly, the military force of Fremen, utilized by Paul in his Universal Crusade, depend on the rough desert environment for training. Despite the unimaginable wealth Paul has brought his people on Arrakis, he sees betrayal and resentment because of the changes that he has brought. Next, I would like to touch on the writing and pacing of the story. 
first and foremost, the story is a slow burn. From what I can tell so far, Dune is a series which focuses on world building, and this story is no exception. In Dune Messiah, we follow a plot to destroy Paul and his newly formed empire. The focus of the story is mostly about the consequences of Paul's actions in the previous novel. With that being established, the story is slow, but not sluggish. The author is deliberate in the journey, but also isn't afraid to stop us throughout in order to paint a picture. Due to the nature of the world building, the story can be difficult to follow due to the many names and words invented by the author. Not only is Dune Messiah enjoyable on the surface level, but it also challenges the reader to question their world as we explore themes present in our society today. Secondly, Herbert creates well-written and interesting characters that feel fully formed and realistic. Going into my final thoughts, I really liked Dune Messiah. Going into the book, I was expecting to not like it, as it is generally referred to as the least preferred text in the series. However, I think once I warmed up to the author's writing style and had a better understanding of the world building after reading Dune, this was a really great read. We get to learn a lot more about characters that I really loved in the original, and we meet some new characters who are just as compelling. As I stated previously, the buildup is slow, but I found the ending of the story extremely satisfying. I'd recommend this not only for lovers of science fiction, but for anyone who enjoys world building akin to Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter.